Now it's my very special pleasure to introduce my MIT uh, colleague, Susan Solomon. Susan is the Lee and Geraldine Martin Professor of Environmental so uh, Studies at MIT and the founding director of the Environmental Solutions Initiative. Susan is probably best known for having pioneered the theory that explains why the ozone hole occurs in Antarctica and obtaining some of the first chemical measurements that helped to establish the chlorofluorocarbons as its cause. Her impressive list of awards is topped by her having received the US National Medal of Science in 1999, and she has an Antarctic glacier named for her. Beat that. <laughs> Please welcome Susan Solomon. Thank you. It's a tremendous pleasure and an honor to, uh, to be here today and to have the chance to uh, move. Maybe I don't need to do that. OK, hopefully not so much feedback. Um, how great that you guys have all turned out. How wonderful that so many people are interested in hearing about this problem. And what a great, great challenge it is for me to, to, to talk to you about all the things I'd like to tell you in, in just about a half an hour. So I've had to be a little bit selective. What I'm going to do is to briefly introduce the problem of climate change. Sorry. Um, talk about climate forcing agents, climate time scales. To me, the time scales are one of the things that make this problem so fascinating and also so, so very challenging. I'll uh, define something we call climate sensitivity which uh, is an important metric for figuring out how the climate will change in the future as CO2 continues to increase. I'll touch on the irreversibility of uh, CO2-induced warming, partly because that surprises most people to hear about it, partly because it has important policy implications when you go to think about what we need to do in the, in the uh, immediate future. And then I'm going to uh, briefly touch on some illustrative risks from, uh, from climate change. Well, it's always incredibly inspiring to me to look at maps like this of the trends in global temperature over the 20th century and just to notice how much of the planet is actually covered by direct measurements, by thermometers, by ships. Uh, and, and what it, it tells us is that the, virtually the entire planet is warming. Overall, the planet's gotten about 0.85 degrees Celsius or uh, about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it was, say, in 1880. The Paris Agreement goal is to keep global mean temperatures from uh, getting above two degrees by all means and to pursue best efforts to uh, not let it go above one and a half degrees. So we're, we're, we're well on the way, and that's part of our problem. It's also very, very sobering, I think, to take a look at the um, 25 warmest years <clears throat> that have ever been measured. And if you're, I believe, uh, 32 years old or more, you've been alive for every single one of them. Even if you're only 20, you've been alive for the great majority of them, so that's pretty amazing. And what that tells you is that we, this generation of people, are living on the uh, warmest planet that has ever been measured in the instrumental record. Sea level rise goes along with that warming, simply because as you heat water, it's going to expand. If you've ever made a cup of tea, you're well familiar with that phenomenon. And how much has our seas how much have our seas risen is, uh, is something that we measure rather well with tide gauges and more recently with satellites, as I'll show you in just a minute. Um, but the um, overall amount of sea level rise is really quite incredible, about a foot since uh, the mid-1800s. So that's a, that's a much higher sea. And if you live on the coast in places like Situate, you're already beginning to experience that, and you're already beginning to worry uh, places like Plum Island, of course, are also very concerned about the safety of their environment. But there's really three sources of sea level rise. It's not just that the hot ocean expands, although that is a major one and has been actually the major one for a long time. 
It's uh, small glaciers melting uh, worldwide are, are also major contributors. And the two great ice sheets are beginning to contribute more and more, actually becoming very much uh, in competition in the last few uh, years. So if we were to uh, continue using greenhouse gases at the rate at which we currently are, particularly carbon dioxide, we'd be looking at a sea level rise by the end of 2100 of about a half to one meter. So a foot and a half to three feet. That's a tremendous amount of sea level rise, and the impacts would just be devastating. It would, it would cover much of Florida. It would uh, destroy uh, many, many cities worldwide unless we're able to spend a lot of money on some very expensive mitigation measures. The ice sheets attract a lot of attention, quite rightly. They're absolutely fascinating because of the, the structure of them and the way they flow. There's always some amount of ice flowing from the ice sheet into the ocean, but there's also snow falling on top of it, so it's also getting replaced. And what's happening now is that the rate at which it's melting and flowing into the ocean uh, is not being uh, replaced by, uh, by, by snowfall, both for the Antarctic and for Greenland, which is a little bit of a new result. Um, when I say an ice sheet, that's really what I mean. It's literally, in the case of Antarctica, 2,000 meters of ice that just sits on top of a continent. And it's been deposited there from ice age after ice age, building up and building up, which has one great advantage, which is that we can go dig up a core and we can measure what the atmosphere was doing going back uh, about a million years is the longest core that we currently have. So that's just a tremendous feature of, of, of ice. We can do things like this, which is to launch satellites that measure gravity. And these are actually quite similar to the ones that Professor Zuber um, uh, was the principal investigator for to investigate the, the moon's gravity field. But what they can do is they can tell you how the, the gravity has, uh, has changed in the polar regions, and that can tell you the mass of the ice sheet. And both ice sheets are losing mass. Uh, the green line is uh, showing you uh, Greenland, I think, and the light blue is Antarctica. So you can see that both of them in the last 20 years or so have lost a significant amount of mass. OK, so why are these changes happening? Why is the Earth getting warmer? Why are these ice sheets melting? Uh, is it something going on in our atmosphere? And as I mentioned, a great place to go look for that is the ice cap itself, where you can dig up your, your core with the bubbles. And if you take a look back at the past 20,000 years in such a core, you're going to see something like this. So sorry, this is 10,000. I sometimes have a graph that's 20. You can see that it's uh, fairly constant for the first, say, 9,900 or so of those years. And then it just goes shooting up. And actually, the last few years have shot up even faster. And now today, we're up to about 410 parts per million of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, compared to only 270 in pre-industrial era. You can see that not, there's not a whole lot of up and down for thousands of years, and then suddenly, boom. Well, carbon dioxide is a critical greenhouse gas that absorbs energy, so that dramatic increase is forcing our climate to change. It's holding more energy in, and we talk about it as a radiative forcing. We know from the ice core data that it's a higher concentration than at least the past 800,000 years, not just the past 10,000. And so it's pretty sobering to me to think about the fact that when those guys were on the planet, we only had 270 parts per million. And you know, when the Romans built the Colosseum, it was about the same. And it's only since the Industrial Revolution that it's gone shooting up like this because of the burning of fossil fuels. We've known about this for a long time. One of the first people to really document it was this physicist, John Tyndall, who uh, did a very, very elegant experiment where he put different gases into uh, a tube. And he passed, uh, he, he had a heat source, and he passed energy through the tube and measured whether or not the energy at the other end was the same as what was coming in using uh, some thermal pile equipment. 
And what he found was, hey, um, you know, depending on what gas I put in that tube, I, I don't get all that, that energy transmitted. And he found that carbon dioxide indeed was one very, very important uh, gas absorbing uh, heat energy or infrared energy. Also, water vapor was studied by him. And he did that way back in 1859. So this isn't really new stuff. And I uh, just want to mention Eunice Foote, who was a chemist, who uh, published a paper that did a lot of similar things. And the publication date of her work is uh, 1856, so you know, three years earlier. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, couldn't resist that one, sorry. CO2 isn't the only greenhouse gas we need to worry about. There are uh, many others, but it is the main one, and it has some very special properties that in many ways make it the worst one, as I'll tell you in a minute. But I just want to mention that some of the other ones we need to worry about are certainly methane, which, as you know, probably comes from, from agriculture, from cows uh, who, who have ruminant stomachs and emit methane as they digest things. Um, but also from rice cultivation, the fields actually do also give off, uh, off methane. Um, and of course, uh, CO2 is produced not only from fossil fuel burning, but also from biomass burning. What's special about CO2 is that, first of all, it is the major driver. Its radiative effect on our planet is bigger than all the rest of these. And uh, it's the only one that can live in the atmosphere for more than 1,000 years. So it has an incredibly long atmospheric residence time. And uh, it's also the only one that's embedded throughout the global economy, as President Reif was talking about. So it makes it a very complex issue indeed. So let me talk about some challenges of climate change processes in time, in space, and in phenomena. We've already uh, touched on snow and ice. And when the, when the, when the ice... Uh, when the ice retreats, that changes the reflectivity of the polar regions, and that has a, a feedback to climate change. It makes it even warmer. The oceans are very important. They take up uh, a lot of heat. In fact, they take up almost all of the heat. So the exchange of, of heat between the atmosphere and ocean is absolutely critical. And the ocean circulation is a very slow process that takes many hundreds of years. It doesn't take too long to get heat into the surface ocean, the top 10 meters or so, but then it takes a long time to go the rest of the way. That turns out to be very important, as I'll mention. Um, we also have to worry about the biosphere. So not only the idea, for example, of burning of, uh, of, uh, of forests, but also the biosphere can take up carbon. And we also have to worry about clouds, which are extremely important in the planetary energy balance. If you've ever noticed that a cloudy night is warmer than a clear night, it gives you some sense that clouds can also affect our climate. They can also keep infrared energy in, and they, they do a, a very important job of that. They're one of the main factors in climate change. The water vapor changes uh, are also important, but both clouds and water vapor are a feedback to the climate changes. They're not a forcing. They have very, very short time scales. You know, you, you evaporate water, you condense water. It only takes a few days. That means that it's going to be in balance with what the CO2 is doing. It's not going to be a driver. It'll be a feedback. So there are phenomena that you have to worry about here that are taking place on time scales of hours or days, like formation of a cloud can only take maybe a, a few hours or even less. Um, formation of clouds, um, sea ice albedo might take years. Those ice sheets are going to take centuries to millennia. Forests can take hundreds of years. So all of those time scales are incredibly important to think about, and that's one of the things that makes this such a fascinating problem to me. The sun, of course, is really, really hot. It's got a temperature of 5,000 degrees Kelvin or so, so it's emitting and heating up our atmosphere with light that is in the visible part of the spectrum. That's why we can see. Um, but our planet is uh, more like 290 Kelvin, so it's emitting in the infrared. And any time we keep that energy that we would like to emit from going out to space, we keep it in with extra greenhouse gases, we're going to make this planet hotter. Complicating the climate problem further still is the issue of spatial scales. Our numerical models in the old days used to kind of look at, at Europe as something like this. 
Nowadays, it's maybe getting even beyond this picture here, but you see the problem. The scales become very, very small, and the need to really simulate what the clouds are doing, what the winds are doing, what the land is doing, the exchange of moisture between the land and the atmosphere is also very important. All of those things make this issue tremendously interesting and tremendously complicated. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some uh, sim simple simulations that I think focus on the fundamentals, a few fundamentals that, surprisingly, a lot of people who are interested in climate don't know. And whenever I talk about this, they say, wow, you're kidding. So um, what I'm going to do to do that is to show you a few calculations that were done with very low resolution, fairly simple models of the Earth system. And the reason that they're low resolution is because we want to run them out a long time, all the way out 1,000 years. And so just as a test case, you can try to see what the Framework Convention on Climate Change's um, uh, Article 2 might have to do with the climate system. Article 2 of the Framework Convention says we, are, we want to stabilize greenhouse gases at a level that avoids dangerous interference with the climate system. So let's, let's not put the system in danger. And so to test that, you could ramp carbon dioxide up to some level. We're now at 410. Maybe you want to ramp it up to, say, 650 or 700, and then just stabilize it, keep it there. Now, that would require continuing to emit CO2, but, uh, but you could figure out how much you need to do to do that. And we'll take a look at what all these different models, one of which I believe is actually the MIT GC, uh, IGSM. Um, you can take a look at what they all give as the temperature as you go forward. And you can see it ramps up, and then it just keeps slowly ramping. And you can look at the thermal sea, sea level rise, too, the, the expansion of the hot ocean. And the scary part is that even though you stabilize the carbon dioxide way back here, temperatures are continuing to rise a little, and sea level is rising even more. So that, again, shows you what incredibly long time scales the, uh, the, the, temp the, the climate system really has. So just to focus in a little bit more sharply, during the period when radiative forcing is increasing, you get what's called a transient climate response. But once you stabilize that forcing, you get the equilibrium climate response. And the scary part is that this number is about uh, 50 to 100% bigger than that number. So roughly twice as much warming, 50 to 100% more warming, is in the pipeline, even after you stabilize. So whatever we're observing now, whatever we're seeing now on this planet as carbon dioxide rises so fast, if we just kept it constant, after a while, we'd see twice as much. And sea level, of course, would be uh, even worse. It would take even much longer, and the relative change would be even bigger. So this is just a further blow up of that to just show you. Here's a case where you've ramped up the temperatures to four times. You ramped up CO2 to four times uh, pre-industrial levels. Temperatures stabilize over time scales of hundreds of years. Sea level just keeps going and going and going. And uh, eventually, and certainly, if that kind of thing happens, we will have changed the geography of this planet. And here's an example of how we could change it, how we probably may indeed well change it. Uh, just showing you what would happen on Greenland if we stabilize CO2 at, say, 500, 700, or 1,000 parts per million going forward to the year 3,000, to the year 4,000, to the year 5,000. And if you have 1,000 parts per million in our atmosphere by the end of 2100, basically Greenland will, will be gone. And that's a further um, uh, six feet of sea level rise. OK, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about carbon, just uh, to briefly introduce you to some aspects of how the carbon cycles on our planet. We're emitting our human emissions are, say, this, this value, nine units. That's a little bit out of date, but this is just illustrative. Plants will take some up as they form their leaves, so three would go into photosynthesis. The ocean will take some up, about two goes into uh, the surface ocean, and the rest of it will stay in, in the atmosphere. So the rest of it will be uh, building up and building up and building up. 
And the only way to uh, get rid of it would be to, uh, well, you could think about, well, maybe if you planted enough trees, you could get rid of some of it. But on the other hand, those guys are eventually going to decompose. And when they do, that carbon comes back. And the trees also respire. Maybe you could put more in the ocean, but that turns out to be tough for reasons that have to do with ocean chemistry that I'm going to talk about in a second. So if you take a look at CO2 removals over time, this graph is a little complicated, and I know it might be hard to see in the back, but this is the first 100 years, the next from 200 to 1,000, and then 10,000 years. And you can see what happens if you start up here at 1,200 parts per million, you have sort of an exponential looking decay for the first 100 years. And that's when the, o the upper ocean, that surface ocean I talked about, is uh, taking up the, uh, some of the carbon. It's also acidifying the surface ocean, as I'll talk more about in a second. And the land biosphere is taking some up. But then that's, that sink saturates. So then the, the rate of that slows down. To get more taken up, you've got to go to the deep ocean. Now you're talking about circulating that entire vast deep ocean, and that takes much, much longer yet. Now you've uh, got basically everything you can get in that ocean, and the only way you're going to get more in is actually by, wet, by adding sediments and carbonates to the ocean, because you have to change the chemical balance. So why am I saying this? Basically, what's happening is something that anybody who's taken chemistry knows. CO2 reacts with water to make an acid, H+, plus, plus a, a weak um, a bicarbonate. So that's the initial step. This is a buffered solution. And what it means is you, you get to a certain point where you can't take any more CO2 up that way. But you also have to obey this equilibrium. And this equilibrium means if you could get some more carbonate into the system, you could take up some more CO2. And that means you've got to weather rocks, and that takes 100,000 years or so. So CO2 dissolves in the seawater, acidifies the ocean, but there's a limit to that. And if you want to get rid of more of it, it's just going to take a very long time. So basically, 20% of the carbon that um, I emitted today when I drove to the park and ride, I didn't drive to MIT, I drove to a park and ride, um, but 20% of that is still going to be here in 1,000 years. And that, for me, was a mind-blowing fact when I began doing this work. So let's just do another test then. Gee, well, if that's how bad it is with things like stabilization, why don't we try just going cold turkey. I mean, maybe that's unrealistic. Probably, I'm sure it is. But let's just ramp the CO2 up to 450, 550, 650, et cetera. And just as a physics test, we'll then just stop. And so here's what happens to the CO2. It slowly decays away from wherever you stopped, as I, as I said. But now, here's what happens to the temperatures. And here's what happens to the sea level. So if you take a look at the warming, the, the frightening thing is that even if you go cold turkey, temperatures stay almost constant for 1,000 years, plus or minus half a degree. So all you've managed to do is cut off that extra 50 or 100 percent. You, uh, you still have an incredible legacy from the carbon that you've already emitted. And that is uh, the fundamental basis behind a quantity called cumulative carbon. What that's telling you is that it's the cumulative amount that's emitted that actually controls the amount of warming that you get. Because even if you stop, as I showed you here, stop and let it decay away, the warming stays constant, which means that it's been determined by the amount emitted. Why does this happen? It's a little bit complicated, but I just want to very quickly say that it fundamentally has to do with the fact that warming and carbon both involve the uh, very slow ocean timescales. So again, the timescales come into this thing. Carbon is taken up slowly, as I showed you, but the ocean heat that gets taken up, um, it, the, the ocean is taking up heat from the atmosphere, uh, and that slows down over time if you stop uh, emitting CO2. So the two terms just happen to roughly cancel. There's no real physical reason why they should do that, but they do. And the, the, the net outcome is to keep temperatures essentially constant for 1,000 years. 
So what about other climate forcing agents? Well, I think it's important to look at those because they, in a way, are uh, an escape hatch. I don't think we should, by any means, abrogate reducing CO2 and actually try to reduce a tropospheric ozone instead, uh, because obviously CO2 is the big problem. But still, the fact that you could, for example, clean up smog, and smog makes tropospheric ozone, which is itself a greenhouse gas. It also does some bad things to crops and uh, does some very bad things to human health. So we could clean up smog and hit several problems at one time. That doesn't seem like a, a bad thing to do. Um, and certainly in places like Beijing, people are thinking about that very, very seriously now. Uh, you could also reduce methane emissions. So you could, for example, try to uh, really make um, uh, fossil methane uh, explore exploration much, much tighter than it currently is, and steps had been being taken in that direction for a number of years. Um, methane is also produced from biomass burning, so bi reducing biomass burning helps with both CO2 and methane. Chemical science really paved the way to understanding a broad range of non-CO2 mitigation options. And uh, again, while they shouldn't replace the fact that our job one has to be CO2, if we really want to avoid one and a half or two degrees, we're going to have to think about these things too. So individuals and groups make choices to take risks. This is actually not a risk that I would ever take personally. But um, you know, different people have different ideas about, about what's risky. And it's really the job of a scientist to give a balanced evaluation of pluses and minuses, what we know and don't know. And uh, I believe that that aids the kind of clarity and consensus that builds a, a, a political will to do something, not just for today, but for 10 years from now, and 20 years from now, and 30 years from now, which is what it's going to take. So let's just revisit some of those risks very, very quickly, because I really want to help set up the, the, all the panelists today. If you uh, take a look at the global average warming as a function of CO2 equivalent concentration, where CO2 equivalent is the CO2 plus the other greenhouse gases, which can be made into an equivalent factor. You can look at the transient warming that you get as you ramp up to, say, 800 or 1,000, and then look at the equilibrium warming. So there again is that doubling at stabilization that I talked about. And you can have a look at uh, what sorts of impacts you might imagine. Well, for one or two degrees C of warming, a 200 to 400% increase in area burned per degree in parts of the Western United States. That kind of thing, some would argue, is already happening. For one to four degrees warming, five to 10% less rainfall per degree in the Mediterranean and in uh, parts of Southern Africa. Um, you can go down the line and look at a lot of, of really very concerning impacts. Five to 10% less stream flow, so less water in our rivers. 5 to 15 percent less yield of U.S. corn and African corn and Indian wheat, uh, clearly things that are very important to people. Um, for 3 degrees C, well, you know, a lot of loss of coast, coastal wetlands and, and uh, many millions more people at risk of coastal flooding. In terms of extremes, 9 out of 10 summer seasons expected to be warmer than all but one summer season uh, now. And it goes on and on. So it, it begins to build to a very, very concerning picture, particularly when you build in this factor of two, which most people don't know about. And there it is again. OK, so I just want to uh, very quickly talk about one other time scale problem in the climate system or in the, in the whole planetary system. And that is, that is us, the human side of the problem. So why do we use carbon dioxide? Well, we use it mainly for energy and transportation, but also for industry, households, things like fuel oil, the service sector. Who's doing it? This just shows you the carbon dioxide emissions, tons per person per year in 2015. And our country is right here at about 16 tons per person, up there with Australia, Canada, Austri uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, a few others. And if you take a look at the European countries, they emit about half as much, in part because they typically have more efficient energy systems, but they also have less transportation. 
And when you look at this graph, you look down here at countries like India and Chad and Ethiopia, and you just say, well, they don't emit very much, do they? And everyone who's ever seen me give a talk like this knows what I'm going to do next, because I think it's so important for us all to understand, because it's fundamental to recognizing this problem isn't just about science or just about technology. It's also about ethics and caring. Uh, and so what I've done is to take the previous numbers and turn them on their head. What I'm showing you now is the ratio of our US per capita emissions to that of the country of interest. So it's a log scale, and the number at the top is uh, Congo, and the number is about uh, 250. So what that's saying is that every one of us emits 250 times as much carbon in a year as the average Congolese does in a year. Is anybody going home for Thanksgiving? Raise your hand if you're taking a, an airplane to, say, the west coast of the United States for Thanksgiving. Anyone brave enough? Oh, come on. I see a few hands out there. I bet there's some more. And I just, just you know, you should do that. Your parents are, are you know, want to see you, need to see you. But still, uh, when you do that, you will have emitted about as much as the average Kenyan does in a year. Uh, but, but go, go, and have a good time. Um, <laughs> But it just tells you how important it is, really, that, that we change the situation that we're currently dealing with. It's easy to say China uh, emits more than we do, and they do, but they also have a lot more people than we do. Their number has gone up a little, but still, uh, we're still emitting more per capita than China. So what it amounts to is people who live like this just don't consume carbon the way people who live like that or people who live like that. And if you go ahead and add it up over the whole world, we have 6 billion people in the developing world, and they emit four times less fossil carbon per person than the other 1.5 billion who, in the, who are in the developed world. So if those guys develop using fossil energy the way we did, the planet is going to be in very, very, very deep trouble indeed. And it really tells you how essential it is that we act quickly partly because development is so important. Development is, is what brings health and well-being to, to the develop, developing world, and it, it, it cannot be slowed down by anything. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I really appreciate everyone coming out today. Thank you.